What's up Backgammon fans? This is Mark Olsen from BackgammonGalaxy.com. In this video we're gonna do a little breakdown of the legend himself, Mr. Paul McGreal and his legacy, Backgammon from 1976. We're gonna have a look at some of the concepts and idea that he had, uh, try to understand how he was thinking about Backgammon. You know, he was a truth seeker. He did a lot of manual rollouts and investigation way before the computer era. So uh, he found out a lot of concepts. Um, of course, there was also some concepts he didn't find. You can imagine that he was walking around in a dark tunnel with a flashlight, just trying to find new concepts. Uh, but he didn't have the, the computers, obviously. It's such a big advantage. So uh, in this video, uh, I will try to shed some light on some of the concepts he wasn't aware of, that he hadn't maybe found yet, or he didn't really know how to apply them properly. Um, you know, obviously a grandmaster of today, like myself, we have the computers to our assistance, it's such a great help. It's kind of like walking around uh, with a three times as big flashlight as he was, so we can go even deeper in the tunnel and shed light on and find new concepts and more nuanced or second level concepts that McGrill didn't, uh, didn't find. Okay, so we're gonna review a chapter in McGrill's book, but before we get started, please smash that like button, okay? If you like the videos we produce here in Backgammon Galaxy, smash the like button, press on the subscribe and the little notification bell. Okay, you've done it? Good, okay, let's begin. So, we're gonna look at a game from, uh, by the way, I have the original book here, the first edition. It was uh, signed by Paul McGrill himself to uh, Jens Niergaard, who I bought this book from, and uh, yeah, this is his signature, X22. So the pages that I'm going to be talking about is from this first edition. I'm not sure if they changed in the newer one. But uh, we're going to have a look at uh, the basics in this basics section from page 15, uh, 59. And uh, he reviews a holding game. So he runs through an entire game here and comments on it. And I think it's a quite... Uh, useful way of explaining um, concepts to a beginner, uh, like just showing the flow of the game. Um, he got a lot of the, you can call it like first level uh, concepts, he got them right. Uh, but we're gonna see that uh, there's some misapplication of concepts as, as well, and some concepts that he wasn't even aware of. And he unfortunately makes blunders because yeah, he, he just doesn't have the, the knowledge yet. So this is what we're gonna see in this video. So let's begin. So the game is an illustrative game. I put the names here, X22 and X23. Um, yeah, so let's get started here. So he, uh, White starts with 6-4 and he opens up with the running play. By the way, he completely discarded the making the deuce point here uh, with the 6-4 in the opening. That wasn't part of the, of the general uh, knowledge at that time. They considered it to be a, a fishy play and uh, it's something that came on later when we kind of realized uh, the value of a blitz. We didn't just play pure and for the priming game plan all the time. So he completely uh, dismisses that play. And uh, he does discuss uh, the other play coming out and splitting. But that, his opening move and opening theory is something I'm going to discuss in another video. Um, so he, yeah, we, let's go back to the game. 6-4 run, 3-1, obviously make the golden point, coined by McGrill. Uh, 6-2, so now we gotta play safe of course, and then the deuce, as he comments in the book, is very close between these two plays, and it's actually true, it is very close, but he chooses to step up. And now we got a 6-3, and here I think it's very easy for me to see that we need to hit, and then with the 6 we're probably gonna unstack and bring a builder down, but McGrill chooses the running play. Okay, we're gonna analyze all the moves with Extreme Gammon, in a moment. Let's just run through all the moves first. 5-3. Okay, so we got a hit, and then we could consider maybe the blitzing, but it's a little bit deep and we're outboarded. We don't want to leave a direct shot. So McGrill correctly brings two checkers down and makes the hit. 4-3. Another good three for the attack. But yet again, McGrill chooses the more conservative route, which is to make the anger. Okay, it's a very really good anger because your opponent is, is stacked here. Um, you prevent all the blitz value when you're making this anger, and okay, it's a it's a reasonable play, but for me the three here 
is is the checkers are screaming to me to hit with a three, but McGrill makes the advanced anger. Double sixes, what a great shot for White. So now he's gonna come out, that's for sure. And since he's ahead in the race, he should now be thinking about coming, bringing his checkers home safely. The play McGrill finds is this play. He makes the deuce point, and he points out that in this play you make an inner point. So if you compare it for, to, for instance, 13 to 1 with the last two sixes, it doesn't make an inner point. Ooh, there's something there. We're going to get back to this. 4-2, he develops his front position. That's standard, of course. He's in a holding game. He want to maximize his contact value. 6-5, okay, you just bring checkers home. 6-2, now there's several plays available, but I like the one McGrill finds. He brings two checkers down, which is unstacking the midpoint and quite flexible. 5-1. Okay, so here McGrill correctly makes the ace point. You could have also considered maybe making the five point, but this is a very bold play because you don't want to leave a direct shot here when you're way up in the race and you're playing a holding game. So McGrill makes the ace point. 6-5. Okay, here's a little decision for you or for McGrill because either you make the deuce point which is a little bit impure because you have the gap on the three point. So this is something you want to do if you expect to get the shot now. If white is very stripped and might be forced to leave a shot, you want to increase the strength of your inner board. But if you're not going to get a shot right now, maybe in two or three turns ahead in time, you probably prefer to play something more pure like slotting the three point and making the seven point because that's going to give you a better precision in a couple of rolls from now. But McGrill chooses the short-term uh, strength by making the deuce point. Fair enough. White is a bit stripped. Okay, this move really caught my eye because here uh, McGrill correctly identifies that White is in a holding game, in an advantageous holding game way up in the race and his game plan is to bring his checkers home. So the play McGrill makes is this play. He, he brings the checkers down from the midpoint to make the nine point and having a little bit of prime going on here. That's a move we're going to get back to. 4-3. Okay, McGrill could slot the three point here, but it's also fine to just play his play, which is to do something in the outfield. 6-2. Another decision. So we're, we're forced to leave a shot here as white. So he can either play something like 10-2 to two, or he could play something like 9-7. Nine to three. McGrill chooses to clear from the rear. That's a concept that he identified. So at least he stays true to that principle. But he under undervalues some other concepts that we're going to talk about later. He does play ten to two. And then blue hits and builds the eight builds the eight point with the five. Good play. White fans. Double three for blue, and now he just closes out. It doesn't really matter too much. Uh, how you play the last three. McGrill has a tendency to get direct attackers or builders while the more modern day style is to increase your outfield control a little bit more uh, in case he rolls a 6-1 and have more indirect builders or hitters. But that's a small detail. 3-1 uh, for white, he comes in. 4-2, now he attacks. And again, we see McGrill playing 8-2, uh, sorry, 8-6 with a deuce where a modern player probably would have played something like maybe this play instead. But it's fine. It's also a good play. And now he fans. And then he closes out. And then there's not really much more exciting going on here. Uh, he just gets to a pair off and wins the race. OK. Let's go back and let's review with extreme gammon analysis. OK, I'm almost all the way back here. Good. And then we're going to do. There we go. Okay, Ooh, we already see some red, some red colors here. Okay, let's let's run through this game. Four, six four. Yeah, again, not too much to talk about. I'm gonna cover his opening theory in another video. Then we got the three one. Of course, <laughs> anybody would make the, the five point even back then. Six two. As we can see here, it's very close between the two plays because we are ahead in the race as white. We're gonna be ahead 14 pips after the move. Therefore, it does make sense to creep up and try to achieve freedom next run, uh, next turn. But because of the stack on the midpoint, it's just so inflexible, you know. So 
the machine extreme gammon here prefers slightly to unstack and create that extra builder very very useful builder on the 11 point and just stay back one more turn on the 24 point but bo of course both deuces are pretty good and it's close 6-3 here's here's a big one this one shows that McGreal didn't really understand this concept so what's the concept here well you don't want this jagger to achieve full freedom you need to attack and that's why we have the rule of thumb attack a blot prime an anger because a single checker is slippery as an eel. You know, it's got, it, it takes one good roll and then he's out of there. So McGreal must attack this checker. Furthermore, he's down in the race and he has a superior front position. He has a stronger inner board and more prime value. So any, uh, all of the variables here are indicating that he should hit. And after hitting, the best six is to unstack the heavy midpoint and bring another builder down. The risk of getting hit here is quite minimal because he's already down in the race and even getting a third checker back actually gives him more flexible over here to make an advanced anger than he has now with just two checkers. So McGreal makes a big, big blunder here, running out all the way. It's a very weak play, uh, this running play. He leaves all the initiative to blue. He has his full role, or sorry, to white. He has his full role at his disposal. He's putting a checker in front of a stack. This goes against modern blood placement theory that I've described really, really clearly in in, in my book here, uh, from ba basics to badass. Um, yeah, it's it's a really weak play running here. Uh, the hit is mandatory, but even just a play like this one, let's just. Analyze this play on plus plus. There we go. Yeah, you see, even this play, the slotting play, is even better. It's way better than the running play. Simply just because coming out here in front of a stack is so weak and you don't develop at all. So at least with this play, the the slotting play, there's some development going on. You get to unstack your midpoint, you slot a useful pure priming point. And there's a bit of four, uh, four duplication as well because he needs a four here, he needs a four here. Okay, let's move on. Five, three, good play from McGrill. Four, three, again, the same concept here. He's not attacking the blood. He should be playing aggressively. He has the stronger inner board. That's actually something that McGrill pointed out himself. Whoever has the stronger inner board can afford to make bold plays. And he's it down in the race. Those are the two main uh, main variables. If you're down in the race, or if you have the stronger inner board, that's indicators that you need to make a bold play. So again, he fails to make the, the 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 clearly the best play here. Of course, the anger does have a lot of value when White has a stacked position, a stacked and front-loaded position, because there's a lot of blitz value in this structure here ton of blitz value 11 checkers in the zone but there's no prime structure so the anger s simply just eliminates all the prime and the the blitz however white is also way ahead in the race so if he can simply achieve full freedom he's winning he doesn't need a prime he doesn't need a blitz he just needs to escape and then win the game so blue should be fighting here but he didn't okay next interesting position here. now white gets a double six and McGrill correctly identifies the game plan. He needs to run. He understands the, what I call the rule number one in backgammon theory. When you're ahead in the race, race. So he understands this concept. He also understands the concept of clearing from the rear. He, he talks about this several times in the book. So McGrill ran here with the two first sixes. This is, I mean, this is obvious. Uh, but the question is, how do you play the next two sixes? So McGreal ended up finding this play, making the deuce point, saying that he uh, he wanted to have an inner port inner port point. What he the concept he wasn't aware of here was that when you're in a holding game and you're trying to bring your checkers home, you need to start clearing points from the rear, especially the midpoint. That's the difficult point to clear here, and he failed to do so. He just didn't really understand the importance of getting started to clear the midpoint. 
So that's why it's almost a blunder here. We can see his play is almost a blunder because he's failing to recognize this concept. He needs to start clearing from the rear. And so this checker must go. The best play is, oh, let me use the extreme gammon errors, is this play. It doesn't matter that you put a checker on the ace point because you're not playing a priming game. It doesn't matter that you don't build an inner board point because what do you want inner board points for? You're playing a holding game. It's a race. You're maximizing your race value. Your prime and blitz value are already down to zero because of this anger here. So what do you need an inner board point for? Furthermore, in terms of long-term flexibility, the right play only puts one checker behind blue's anger, while as McGrill's play puts two checkers behind the anger. So he has less future flexibility. And most importantly, he failed to, to clear the rearmost point for spare checkers so he can clear the midpoint next time. This is a pr pretty significant error. And uh, McGrill simply didn't understand this concept. Even though he understood the first level concept of clearing from the rear, he just failed to see the subtle details and apply it in this position. Okay, now we get 4 2. Of course, blue is just. De developing his front position to maximize his contact value. Blue's game plan here is now only based on contact value because he's so much down in the race that his race value is pretty close to zero. And of course, there's no prime or blitz value because white has full freedom. He has escaped all of his back checkers. It's a defined state position. So all of blue's value comes from contact value or race value. And since he's so much down in the race, it's all about contact now for blue. But as we can see here, uh, blue still wins the game 30.7% uh, of the time. So he has a plenty of contact value here. He has the contact of this point in particular, which is six away and all these checkers needs to go home and two checkers behind the anger, gap, gap, gap. So there's a lot of contact value here for blue. Um, where were we? Uh, I think we were, oh yeah, 6-5. So white simply just plays a 6-5. It just brings checkers home. But you see now, white has a beginning to get into a little bit of flexibility problems here. He has three checkers buried behind the anger now. It's, that's a loss of flexibility. He's quite stripped. So he doesn't have too many spare checkers left. All of his spares are mostly here in the six point. And this one is very useful as well. But he needs to start clearing those, those rear points now. Okay, so... 6-2 uh, for blue, he brings 2 down, that's fine. 5-1 for white, that's also a good play. We see here that making the 5 point is actually not a big mistake. It's just the 27 millipoints. That's something that... Uh, it, making the 5 point would improve white's position tremendously in terms of having a safe space for bringing his checkers home. This gap is going to be really annoying in the long run. So it's kind of like a pay now decision. It is a mistake because usually you really don't want to leave shots in a holding game. You don't want to get hit. But here the machine says, okay, it's actually quite close. You might consider a pay now, but it is correct not to leave any shots. And McGrill correctly plays uh, six to one, two to one, make the eight, eight point, ace point. Six five for McGrill, <laughs> for McGrill, both of them are McGrill. Six five for, let's say X, X 23. <laughs> Um, uh, here we had the trade-off, you know, we talked about it before when we ran through the moves. He can either make the deuce point, which ensures some inner point, point inner board strength here and now, but it sacrifices a little bit of long-term strength because you leave a gap, so it's impure, you need to fill out that gap. Or you could play pure, which is weaker in this sequence, but in the future it's going to be stronger because now you can make the the prime in the right order and have a stronger prime in the future. So McGrill here chooses the short term uh, value, which is to make the deuce point, And it's actually the correct play. It's because white is sufficiently stripped out here. So he is actually threatening to hit something maybe in one or two sequences. So it's good to lock down this, this uh, asset of the deuce point. Now we see a move. This one really caught my eye when I was reading the book. Yeah, here McGrill um, he he simply doesn't he he. There's a leak here in his understanding. Um, he he recognizes the game plan. The game plan is, of course, to bring the checkers home safely without getting hit. He he's aware of the concept of clear from the rear, but here I think this is my interpretation of what McGreal 
didn't understand at the time. So let me get a little bit of get a little bit philosophical on you guys. He made this move. He made the nine point, and this is a huge blunder. It's 230 error, double blunder, because now you have so many points to clear, and all of these points are in the contact zone of the anger. The best play looked like this. You play two down, and then you clear the 10 point. Now you only have two points to clear, and these checkers are out of the direct range. What a clever play. But let me try to try to analyze or break down what I think that McGrill didn't really understand about this position. So let me try to get a little bit philosophical here. Let me just uh, bring in a new Bagaman board here. Let's do like let's do like this. Okay. Good. Um, so in backgammon. A point is, uh, let me clear the board here. In backgammon, you know, actually I like the, the way McGrill describes it in his introduction that backgammon is, is not only a race. That would be a, a, a big simplification of, of the game. Backgammon is uh, kind of like an obstacle course because the fact or the rules state that when you have two checkers or more than a point, you own the point and you block your opponent from moving to this point. That, kind of makes it into like an obstacle course where you have to jump over your opponent's uh, assets. You can't land on them. Um, so this, this kind of boils down to the core functionality of a point. So let's get a little bit philosophical here. What, what use does a point make? Well, it has a dual function, you could say. The first function is that it prevents your opponent from moving to this point. So it has a blocking function. That's very useful, especially if you make multiple points of them in a row and you block your opponents completely from escaping, especially the, the powerful, all power, almighty six prime, right? Um, so that's very useful. The other function of a point is that it's a safe space for your own checkers to land. So this is also very useful. So that means that when you make a prime early in the game, it's going to be so useful either way because either you're going to use it to block your opponent from moving. That is especially important if you're down in the race, so the pip count is not in your favor. Then you really need to block him and prevent him from moving here because even if you're down in the race, if you keep him blocked and you get all of your checkers into your home board, oh, oops, the moment that you finally let go of your prime, even though he has all of his checkers crunched and so he's actually ahead in the race by two pips here, White is still a huge favorite because he has so many rolls to go before he can bring the last two checkers into his home board. And then he also has a lot of wastage. And in the meantime, White is going to be peeling off checkers. That's why the prime needs to be in this area of the board is to keep him trapped because you need to let go of the prime when you have all your checkers in your home board and then you start bearing off. An outfield prime, let's say a prime that's like that goes like this is not as as powerful because when you break this prime white still has so many pips to go before he can start taking checkers off and in the meantime blue will have a much easier time running home and winning the race that's why when you're ahead in the race when you're down in the race you need to make a prime and the prime needs to be preferably an inside prime that's a powerful prime because then the race doesn't matter you're going to win the game but when we are ahead in the race then at some point, our prime, let's, let's make a position here where, where we are ahead in the race. Something like, like this, let's say here. White is ahead by 20, 26 pips. Forget about this 5-1, it doesn't matter. Um, at some point, when we're ahead in the race, each point can become a liability. You still prefer these points here to be landing spots for the, or safe places for the rest of the checkers to land. But the seven point is all of a sudden a liability because there's no more checkers behind that needs a safe space to land. So this point is now actually in blue's favor because it has contact and he might get hit. So now the seven point is not an asset anymore. It's a liability and it needs to be cleared. And now in this case, now it will be the six point that is a liability and needs to be cleared. Now it's the five point that needs to be cleared. So when we had the, this position of a six prime here, for instance, these points down here, the five, to, the two to the five point, and 
also still the six point as long as we have checks on the seven point they still serve their dual function or the, one of the main functions of their dual functionality of being a safe space for your checkers your checkers behind them to, to come home safely and this is actually what uh, went wrong here from Paul McGrill he thought that the checkers on the nine point or I can only speculate of course what he was thinking I think that he thought that the checkers on the nine point might be useful in terms of clearing the ten point but I mean this is a bit of a stretch when you can simply just clear the ten point outright you know why why would you create that liability of having two new points to clear even in the most dangerous range which is six away and five away so obviously this is such a such a good move and remember the game plan here our game plan is to race we need to bring our checkers home safely we don't need a prime priming points if we make the priming move of McGrill here now all of a sudden these checkers or these points have become liabilities they don't serve the priming functionality because we're so much ahead in the race we don't need to prime so they lost their one of their core functionalities we need to bring our checkers home and uh, that's yeah, that's what he he didn't he, he didn't fully understand this concept I believe which caused him to make this play I'm sure that he is aware of of when uh, or the, the the concept that the race determines whether you want to prime or run because he mentions this other places in the book so he he actually knew that concept so maybe he he should have been able to find the best move here or he simply misunderstood this idea of asset and liabilities of points when they are assets when they are liabilities anyway that was a long story okay so now he blue gets a 4-3 yeah okay it doesn't really matter how you play this as long as you play it somewhat flexible and here's the last mistake that he makes with a 6-2 so here's another little subtle concept that he he gets wrong um, he he uh, clears from the rear so he follows the principle which is by all means fair enough but there's a couple of other more subtle c concepts that he's misapplying here so let's see how the final position looks after his play it looks like this okay so what do we got here on the tactical side we got 14 hitters right because we got 11 out of 36 with the sixes then we got one five and then we got double three so that's a total of 14 out of 36 what else do we got well we just killed the checker that's not good in case of a hitting exchange or something like this this is a big liability if it's just a race then it doesn't matter but it might get into because if he hits us and we enter and now we want to hit back and stuff this dead checker is a liability okay what about another problem here when he hits then he is fully escaped with that back checker so let's look at the best play it's this one let's look how that looks it looks like this clearing the nine point so on the tactical side this is just 13 shots one shot less it's all threes and one two it doesn't have any dead checkers actually it puts a very useful and efficient slot on the three point what about some of the hits here with the three like let's say blue rolls a three one he's gonna hit and he's gonna build the eight point now he's not fully escaped with that hitting checker he has two checkers still to be hit so if white gets lucky with a double three or a, or a f double one or a three one or something like this he can come in from the bar and then he can hit that checker so the fact that he would still have two checkers back checkers is more powerful for white so this is the concept of having a little bit of structure behind the point where your opponent wants to hit it's a subtle concept that comes up sometimes and of course it's also the concept of efficiency don't kill a checker even though McGrill was very very keen on this point he pointed it out many times don't kill checkers and actually I think he called it to kill checkers not to bury checkers that's something we maybe I think that was Roberti who called it to bury checkers McGrill called it to kill checkers but uh, yeah so that's that's an efficiency concept 
So here's a subtle, subtle mistake. It's not a blunder. Uh, I can definitely forgive him for making this mistake. But again, we see just he he had the the overall ideas right, but the subtle concepts he simply just hadn't figured them out yet. And I believe now we get a hit. I believe that's the last interesting decision. Yes, that's it. And then he actually misses some. He he doesn't mention the cube. It could be because he's in the basic section, and. Uh, and therefore he just ignores the cube but uh, of course blue should claim the game here he is uh very powerful here because he's got ton of blitz and prime value white is on the bar on a four point board and white has uh killed the checker and no prime value it's easy for black to yeah it's just a huge pass um, but he doesn't mention the cube that's gonna <laughs> increase his error rate a bit small mistakes here like we talked about after hitting then eight to six is a little bit better Oh, sorry, uh, eight to six is his play. So he had a tendency to bring the direct builders, whereas modern players more have a tendency to maximize outfield control and increase the indirect builders. So Extreme Gammon actually li likes this move. Maybe it's it's getting, uh, it's focusing more on the seven point here. Yeah, small detail, no, no big deal. And then, yeah, that's it. That's basically it. So that was this game. Uh, let's look at the summaries here. So we got PR 15 and PR 17. <laughs> not, not too impressive. Uh, I'm sure that many of you guys can do much better than this um, today. But of course he's forgiven because this was 1976. Uh, I believe his PR at the time was probably like a seven or an eight uh, in average. So um, yeah, what can I say? Uh, so this was chapter six in McGrill's backgammon. Uh, it's, yeah, it's page 59 in my book and goes to page 80 something, 85, I think. Um, check it out if you have the book. If you haven't got the book, to be honest, if you want to learn backgammon, don't read it. Don't read it. Read it as a historical read. Uh, you should definitely be, uh, be looking at this book instead, From Basics to Badass. Uh, this is my book. It's a bestseller. I believe it's the be best-selling book of the last many years uh, on Amazon. So I would probably recommend this. It goes through a lot of these concepts one by one. And um, yeah, and that's it. Guys, if you like this video, remember to leave a comment. It can be about anything. It can be questions. It can be co uh, comments on, on this video, on the specifics. What do you think about McGreal? What do you think about my breakdown? What do you want to see in the future? And if you haven't already, like and subscribe. Very important, smash the like button. And see you guys in the next video.